episode 64 of the Real World Wellness Podcast. Hi everyone, I'm Christine Lehman, a nutritional therapy practitioner and reverse diabetes coach, which is also the name of my website. I help clients reverse chronic conditions naturally through diet, exercise, and stress management. I also see clients by Skype, so we don't even have to be in the same city or country. If you haven't checked out my podcast page, you want to do that because you can find some of my favorite products, such as free-range turkeys and chickens, which are still in stock, and ground turkey meat, ground beef, and patties at U.S. Wellness Meats. Given that Thanksgiving is only two days away, we celebrate it on November 24th in the United States. I wanted to create a special episode devoted to this holiday. But before I get into talking turkey and recipes, I want to explain a little bit about this distinctly American holiday. You may not know that Native Americans played an important role in helping the early settlers called pilgrims when they landed at Plymouth, Massachusetts. I wrote an article about this holiday for the Washington Post several years ago where I interviewed a Lakota Sioux Indian and a historian at the Plymouth Plantation Museum in Massachusetts. So I'm reading some excerpts from my article. When the pilgrims aboard the Mayflower landed at Plymouth Rock, Massachusetts in 1620, they encountered Indians who were friendly and humane, unlike the quote-unquote horrible savages they had heard about. Quote, we welcomed them and shared our land and our survival skills, which we regret now. Unlike the English, we did not think of land in terms of ownership, but in terms of use. And that's a quote from Sammy Toynita Lakota Sioux at the National Councils of Churches. She said that the traditional Thanksgiving story didn't mention Indian efforts that aided the settlers' long-term survival. We just didn't sit down and share one meal with them at the end of the first harsh winter, but we continued to help them survive, not only in Plymouth, but in other colonies for several years. Author and historian Marion Vulimir, a direct descendant of William Bradford, governor of Plymouth Colony and a member of the United Church of Christ in Yarmouth, Massachusetts, said that Bradford recorded in his journal this appreciation of the Wampanoag Indians helping the pilgrim colonists survive the harsh winters. The pilgrims and the Wampanoags coexisted peacefully for 50 years. So, let's talk about some of the traditional foods that most likely were around back then and that are still very popular. So first and foremost is the turkey. It is a wild bird found in North America. And as far as shopping for one, I do recommend, this shouldn't be surprising to my listeners, that you find a farmer, if you can, a local farmer, who raises his turkeys in in a wild range form, and that would be pastured and grass-fed so that they are allowed to wander free and not um, certainly in cages. However, I've learned over the years that you have to plan ahead to buy your turkeys if you're going to buy them from local farmers because they tend to sell out well in advance of Thanksgiving Day. And frankly, they're not cheap. Uh, They can charge upwards of $65 for one turkey depending on its weight. And the weight is usually listed in pounds on a label. So I'm also going to talk about how you can still have your turkey and perhaps pay less money uh, if you're on a budget um, a little bit later in the show. So what are some of the health benefits of turkey? It's high in tryptophan, which is an an important uh, amino acid that can often uh, make you a bit sleepy after eating it. A turkey, uh, selenium, vitamins B3 and B6. So one of the common questions that you hear when you're gathered around your Thanksgiving table and the person carving the turkey often looks up at everyone and says, well, Do you have a preference, white meat or dark meat? So on Thanksgiving Day, um, if you're health conscious, you may tend to think white meat is better based on the fact that it's fewer calories from saturated fat and calories in general. But dark meat lovers, as the research shows that it trumps white meat when it comes to nutritional benefits. But first, I want to give you a brief primer. What makes turkey and chicken meat lighter or darker? 
has to do with the type of muscle it contains. So darker meat contains more myoglobin, globin, sorry, I'm trouble pronouncing that, a compound that enables muscles to transport oxygen. So if you've ever watched flightless, meaning birds who are pretty much grounded, walk and run, uh, you notice that they have kind of, you might expect that they have muscles in their legs, right, to help propel them forward. So that's no surprise that darker meat is found in the legs of turkeys and chickens, while white meat is found more in their breasts and wings. So back to the nutritional benefits. Compared with white meat, dark meat contains more iron, zinc, selenium, riboflavin, which are important minerals, as well as vitamins A, K, and B complex. So even more than just the B3 and B6 I mentioned earlier. Also dark meat contains the amino acid sulfonic taurine, which can help with anti-inflammation, blood pressure regulation, healthy nerve function, the production of bile acid, which breaks down fat, and other important functions. Now, you may or may not think dark meat is, is healthy because you may be worried about the fat content. However, so to put it in perspective, a typical serving of sliced roasted turkey is about 3.5 ounces, which is about the same size as a deck of cards. So when you compare them side by side, you will see that they're similar in the protein amounts or grams, but keeping the skin on increases the total amount of fat. But keep in mind that our bodies need some saturated fat. About 10% of your total calories should come from saturated fat. So on a typical 2,000 daily calorie diet, that comes to about 200 calories or 22 grams of fat. Each gram of fat is 9 calories. So to put it in perspective, eating um, a piece, let's say 3.5 ounces of dark meat without the skin, provides really only about eight grams of fat per serving with the skin off. So if you're really worried about it, just don't have the skin, but it's only another four grams or 12 grams of fat with the skin on. And with white meat, there's also a little bit of addition of with the skin on of fat, but it's a little bit less than the dark meat. But again, you're getting all these wonderful vitamins and minerals with the dark meat. So unless you're already eating a ton of saturated fat, I say go ahead and enjoy that piece of dark meat with the skin on. Now, having said all that, I have to admit, I still prefer white meat, but I'm going to try having some dark meat as well. So now that we've got the nutrition facts down, uh, we're going to talk about some turkey recipes. And the recipes I'm going to share with you are all paleo. And that means that they're dairy-free, gluten-free, and grain-free, and delicious. But you're going to want to baste the bird. Why? Because it also helps lock in the moisture. So I found this mushroom butter sauce that absolutely sounded delicious. Now, I haven't done it myself, but um, I'm one person, so I have to admit I usually go elsewhere for Thanksgiving. But I'm also going to share some parts of the bird that you can use if you really just have it one or two people in your household and you want to do something, but you don't want to go to the extent of buying a big bird. So let's talk about this mushroom butter sauce recipe. And I'll make the links available in the show notes as well. So this one, and I want to just, of course, the turkey, right, is the centerpiece of most Thanksgiving dinners and a big part of Thanksgiving traditions. So this wild mushroom butter roasted turkey, which looks really delicious. So we're going to assume, again, you have a 10 to 12 pound turkey. The other ingredients you need are garlic powder, ground dried thyme. You can buy a poultry mix or you can finely chop fresh rosemary, sage, thyme, and margarine. You need a half cup of chicken stock, want organic lucidium, and a half cup of good quality and sugar-free barbecue sauce. Now for the butter itself, you want one and one quarter cups dried wild mushrooms, a quarter pound room temperature butter or clarified butter, and which could be ghee, and one tablespoon of white wine. 
Then in terms of preparation, you want to preheat your oven to a 450 degree temperature Fahrenheit. You want to, this I thought was interesting. So it helps if you have a coffee grinder because you're going to grind the dried mushrooms in a coffee grinder to a powder. And then you mix that powder in a bowl with a soft butter or ghee, add the wine, and mix again. Then you clean your turkey and pat it dry. You check the body and neck cavities because there are usually two bags. One contains the heart, liver, and gizzards, and one with the neck. So you always want to remove them before dressing the bird. Then you place the turkey in a large roasting pan. So another thing to think about is do you have a large enough roasting pan for your bird when you're putting it in the oven? Then you cut the skin in a few places on the bird and you place some of the wild mushroom butter between the skin and the flesh with a small spoon or a kitchen syringe. Given my dexterity, I'd probably opt for a kitchen syringe, which you can pick up at any, uh, probably any of the main grocery stores um, in their sort of cooking utensil aisles. And then you season the bird generally, generously with garlic powder, dried thyme, the fresh herbs or poultry mix, and black pepper. And then you spread the rest of the mushroom butter on the surface of the turkey. Then you just cover it with a sheet of aluminum file loosely and put it in the oven. Then you immediately reduce the heat to 350 degrees because remember you're starting out at 450. And then you cook for about 18 minutes per pound. So in this case, that's three and a half hours, and you season with salt and pepper after 30 minutes of cooking. You also continuously baste the bird about every 20 minutes to make sure that the meat stays moist. I think all of us at some point in our life have had very dry turkey meat, and you're just kind of pouring the gravy on <laughs> to try, try and get it moist. So if Keeping it moist is important. So then you remove the aluminum foil an hour before the end of the cooking process to obtain a golden and crispy skin. Then of course you remove the turkey from the oven when it's fully cooked and you take, a, 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 excuse me, take it out of the roasting pan and set it aside covered with the aluminum foil. So you keep that on. And then you let it set for about 20 minutes when you prepare a sauce. And I'll talk about the cranberry sauce a little bit later. And then you also place the pan on the stovetop on a medium hit heat and deglaze with the chicken stock. And then you can add the barbecue sauce. You bring to a boil, then remove that from the heat, and you serve the sauce immediately with the turkey. So that's a little bit different than the traditional gravy, um, but I think it could turn out quite well. And listeners, if you try this out, again, it's Paleo Leap. I will put the recipe in the show notes. Please drop me a line and let it know. Let me know how it goes. So now we're going to talk about a little bit different ideas for turkeys besides the more traditional 10 to 12 pound turkey basting and so on. So one of the ones that I thought was really interesting um, is a way to think about stuffing and this is another paleo recipe um, and it's actually something that I grew up with but the difference is you don't use breadcrumbs right so when you think about stuffing a bird which many people do so those cavities I talked about earlier are where you would place stuffing and then you have it also as a side so you want to make enough to actually stuff the bird with it as well as to have extra for a side dish. I personally love stuffing. It is probably one of my favorite side dishes of the whole meal. And um, But again, because we want to avoid gluten on a paleo diet, and there's so many people with gluten sensitivity, you want to replace the bread. So typically, there's either torn off pieces of bread or breadcrumbs that are used in a traditional American stuffing recipe and so you can replace that with chestnuts or pecans or walnuts instead. And then my favorite stuffing, the kind that my mother made, was made with celery, carrots, and sauteed onions and chicken broth which keeps it moist. So I will include a recipe for that in the show notes. However, so given that I like this kind of stuffing, I was really kind of delighted when I found these stuffed Thanksgiving meatballs by Diane San Filippo, who's the author of Practical Paleo, and I have to say she does a really good job of having some nice 
turkey dishes in here which I'm going to refer to and I also like her cranberry dipping sauce so that's the combination that she uses are these Thanksgiving meatballs with the cranberry dipping sauce so let's talk first about her Thanksgiving meatballs and I believe this is an Italian recipe so one of the things to make it more Thanksgiving-ish, I would replace the ground pork with the ground turkey. Um, the rest of it pretty much is what I described with chopped celery, chopped or grated um, carrots and onions and which is again traditional stuffing ingredients and then also a quarter cup chestnuts or replacing that with walnuts or pecans if chestnuts are available and of course if you have a tree nut allergy you might want to skip that unless it's specific to one not the other and then she uses an Italian uh, sausage spice blend and of course you can create your own spice blend you can use different herbs like sage or marjoram um, and just you know kind of experiment a little bit with that so with that one, you just combine the turkey again, replacing the pork, two pounds of pork with two pounds of ground turkey and the spice blends. And then you melt the butter or coconut oil and then you place the onions, celery and carrots in the pan and saute. And then you add the chestnuts or the other kinds of nuts and you cook for another two minutes. And then when it's cooled, you combine the mixture with the meat, form the the meat into 24 meatballs. So that's one, 24 one ounce meatballs. And then you place them in an oven safe dish on a baking dish and bake for approximately 25 to 30 minutes. So it doesn't take very long and you're going to have this great thank turkey and stuffing taste. Now if you want to make patties instead of meatballs, what you would do is just, I would say, make the equivalent of two meatballs and turn it into a, a bigger patty instead of a smaller meatball. And that also would be great for breakfast. So moving on now to another recipe that involves turkey are these sage roasted turkey legs. So you can you can also have them year round, which is great, but they will remind you of the holidays as well, and of course you can have them on the holidays. So for this recipe, you need two large turkey legs, a tablespoon of melted butter or coconut oil, and then you can do an herb salt blend made with sage, which is, I mentioned, another op uh, option for the turkey meatballs as well, and black pepper to taste. Now, Diane also does a great job in Impractical Paleo of creating very unique, different herb blends. So you might want to just go with what she has. It's on page 230 of the cookbook. So for this sage roasted turkey legs recipe, you preheat the oven to 370 degrees Fahrenheit. Brush the turkey legs again with melted butter, coconut oil. Se season them generously with your blend, your uh, sage salt blend. And then you just put them in a shallow oven safe roasting dish, cover with foil and bake for 30 minutes. So I like this because it doesn't take as long as the more traditional turkey. And it really works well. I could um, see having for one or you know two people, a smaller, smaller number of people. And then you remove the foil and continue to bake until the internal temperature of the turkey reaches 165 degrees Fahrenheit. So the total cooking time actually could take between 45 minutes and 60 minutes. But again, nowhere near the three to four hours that's more typical of a larger bird. So let's talk cranberries. I love having cranberries at this time of year. You can get bags of fresh cranberries in your grocery stores. Um, in a pinch, of course, you can get the canned ones. They may have a little bit more um, sugar in them. So here she talks about a cranberry sauce to actually dip those Thanksgiving meatballs into. And of course if you're going to have sliced turkey you can have a cranberry side dish as well. So for this you need 15 to 16 ounces of fresh cranberries, organic honey or maple syrup to taste, about 1 to 4 tablespoons 
the juice and zest of one orange and to get the zest you usually just kind of have to scrape it and you get little bits of zest and that come off into the bowl that you're using to mix it with. So in a medium sized pot simmer the cranberries and the water juice until all berries have popped open because if you look at the cranberries right they're about a quarter of an inch in size and uh, they're obviously round. So you want the texture to be gelatinous, so it kind of is a little gooey. And then you add the honey or maple syrup to taste. You remove the mixture from the heat and allow it to come to room temperature before refrigerating for later use. So I would, you can also change it up and make a chunky cranberry sauce by adding one cup mandarin orange segments, drained, one cup pineapple, fresh as ideal, because because the canned versions may have additives, so you want to get one without the added sugar. A half cup raw walnuts, chopped or soaked, dehydrated raw nuts are ideal. So that's another great variation on this whole cranberry sauce. So let's talk about sides. You really can't have a Thanksgiving meal without some sides. And some of my favorite ones are butternut squash, really the whole family of squash, but butternut squash is very similar to sweet potatoes. And roasting them is a great way to bring out their flavor, especially at this time of year. So you just want to cube them, or you can buy them already cubed in the stores, which is a shortcut, and I do that. I just bought a uh, container or package of butternut squash that was already cubed. And then you coat it with extra virgin olive oil, you just need like a tablespoon or two, or virgin and coconut oil, and spread them out on a baking sheet, and you cook for at least 30 minutes at 375 degree Fahrenheit until golden brown, and then you just sprinkle some sea salt on them, and you can do this, as I mentioned, with um, sweet potatoes, and just cut them up, and it may, I found the butternut squash when I don't cut them up, sometimes they're bigger pieces or chunks, so it may actually take up to 45 minutes depending on the thickness of the cubes. So another great potato, white potato replacement is cauliflower, and you can really fool people with this dish. It's called mashed potatoes, and for that you just need uh, a head of cauliflower, and if you're going to have uh, a bigger crowd, you might want to do two heads of cauliflower and four tablespoons of butter or coconut oil, or I would even add extra virgin olive oil. And what you want to do is just chop the cauliflower up into chunks, and then you can steam the cauliflower until it's fork tender and place it in a food processor. And occasionally, if I have smaller chunks and are really impressed for time, I don't even bother to steam them. But if you want to make sure they're super tender, you might want to do that. And then while it's um, turning around in the food processor, I just drizzle about a quarter cup of extra virgin olive oil. I, that's my favorite. Um, it's frankly easier <laughs> to pour it right from the bottle than to have to heat um, up the coconut oil or the butter to make sure it's liquid. But either one, any of those would work. And then you puree until smooth and creamy. And then you add a little bit of your herb salt blend or black pepper. I usually add some black pepper and sea salt to taste. And you can add some herbs. You know, I've, I've added some basil or even cilantro to it. And that really kind of added a, a nice little flavor touch. And so that's a great side dish to have as well. And then no Thanksgiving meal would be complete without talking about green beans. That was, that was a standard side dish in my family, and I remember part of my job was to cut up, trim the ends off the green beans for my mother. And um, so I was thinking, well, what can you do with green beans? Well, Diane has this green bean dish with shallots. So she uses two sliced shallots pound of fresh green beans, two tablespoons butter or coconut oil, and she steams the green beans in a basket. And steaming, by the way, is one of the healthiest ways to cook uh, vegetables. So you only need an inch of boiling water for approximately eight minutes until they become a brighter shade of green. 
And while they're steaming, you melt that tablespoon of butter or coconut oil. You place the shallots in the skillet um, where you just heated up the butter or coconut oil and saute until they're translucent and the edges are golden brown. Add sea salt and black pepper to taste. You remove the green beans from your steamer and you place them in a serving bowl and then you just top with the remaining tablespoon of cooking fat and toss to combine and place the cooked shallots on top of the green beans and serves. Now another variation on that, which is probably a bit faster if you don't have shallots or feel inclined to cook them, is just buy some sliced almonds after you steam the green beans and add the little bit of oil. You can toss in maybe a half cup of sliced almonds and mix it all up and that's, that's really delicious as well. But now we want to talk about dessert. You cannot forget about dessert or people will probably complain. And you want to replace the typical crust that you would find in a grocery store, such as a graham cracker crust or some other glute-containing wheat, uh, which would, uh, with tree nuts. So tree nuts, again, um, hazelnuts, uh, pecans, walnuts, all make for a good crust. Now, of course, if you have a tree nut allergy, you want to avoid them. But otherwise, um, that's a good replacement. And one year I avoided the crust altogether and made a pumpkin pie custard. And I want to share that recipe with you because it's pretty much the filling of a pumpkin pie, but in a more custard form. And you do need ramekins for those, which are those small, probably about two inch in diameter, white uh, containers. Um, they're ceramic and I, I will uh, include a recipe for those in the show notes as well. And so you want to have like a cup of organic pumpkin puree, you want to have a cup of full fat coconut milk and all the typical spices, the cinnamon, nutmeg, and ginger. And, and then you want to uh, bake those Preheat the oven to 350 degrees and then you whisk the dry ingredients into the liquid mixture and then you pour the custard into these small ramekins which are oven safe ceramic or glass dishes. You place the ramekins in a baking pan and add enough boiling water to the dish to come up halfway to the top of the ramekins. So that's a little bit tricky in that you can't use a traditional you know, flat roasting or baking uh, sheet. You need something that's a little has a little more of a lip on it to contain the water. So really you're better off using a standard kind of baking dish, either glass or um, some kind of um, aluminum foil or aluminum, excuse me, that you can feel comfortable putting the water into and it's not going to slosh over. And then you place the dish with the ramekins and the water in the oven. You bake for about 45 to 60 minutes. Or, of course, you insert a knife and it comes out clean in the center. You know it's done. And you can serve warm or chilled. You can make uh, a little bit of, you know, creme fraiche, a whipping cream using whole fat milk, or even you could try coconut milk, see how that comes out, and serve that. And everyone has really liked it because it, it is really tastes very similar to a traditional pumpkin pie, but again without the crust, and I think it's a little bit lighter even. So I hope you try out some of these recipes, and I will include several links in my show notes as well to, as to Diane Simpolipo's cookbook, Practical Paleo. Please drop me a line on my podcast page and let me know how it goes. So happy Thanksgiving, everyone, and remember to build bridges instead of walls.